Welcome to this edition of Cranmer Studies and Readings, 5.58 p.m., 15 July 2022. The Lord before us, who can be against us. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We take our beginning here with Alan Weatherall, Cranmer, theologian. Archbishop and Martyr. Introduction. Nearly 500 years ago, King Henry VIII appointed Thomas Cranmer to be England's first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. By the time Cranmer was burnt alive at the stake 24 years later, the Church of England had been established. 42 Articles of Belief the Book of Common Prayer provided religious structure for its church services, and homilies provided material for vicars to use in sermons. All had been substantially written or edited by Cranmer. The Book of Common Prayer became one of the most important books of Western civilization. Recognizable versions are still in use today in over 50 countries. Cranmer was born at a time when people believed in eternal life after death and that how you behaved on earth would decide whether you went to heaven or hell. Graphic illustrations of the fires of hell were painted on church walls. The announcement in 1530 by Protestant leaders in Augsburg, Germany, of different rules for getting to heaven based upon new translations of the Bible must have caused much soul searching. Developments in print technology meant that the English language versions of the Bible became widely available. Any citizens who could read English could read the Bible, subject to frequently changing laws. People were now forming their own opinions of the Bible and religious truth. Disagreements about how to interpret the Bible and how to worship Christ led to people being accused of heresy and burnt alive, Protestants, Roman Catholics, Anabaptists, and others. This book attempts to portray Cranmer's navigation of this lethally shifting moral maze, taking into account his immense achievements and the work that must have taken place <clears throat> to enable those achievements, Cranmer's story challenges our perceptions and is highly relevant to the 21st century. Dramatic license to get closer to Cranmer, we have to envision what he might have thought and felt behind the mask. Within the framework of facts and dates, we have to dramatize his life. Books that dramatize history are allowed in certain latitude events that in reality involved many people or took significant time may be presented as single dramatic incidents involving only a few people important people may be may be omitted the condition for such liberty is that the resulting dra dramatization must be true in spirit to the historic events and subsequent events the dates in this book are correct. All named characters were real people. Conversations, of course, fictional, but hopefully realistic. There are notes at the back of the book on individual chapters. Uh, we'll deal with the reign of Henry VIII, the summons, November 1532, separation, 1532. Cranmer's vision, November 1532, and then it goes through his life here. Reunion with Baton Boleyn, coronation processions, coronation of Anne Boleyn, death of the heretic John Frith, 1533, 10 articles, 1536, the Bishop of Winchester, 1536, Anne Boleyn's execution, Pilgrimage of Grace, October 1536, the Marriage Ceremony, 1538, 
Bishop Thomas Beckett, 1538, A Little Life for Right Relief, The Six Articles, 1539, Preface to the English Bible, 1539, Re uh, The Fall of Cromwell, 1540, Homilies and Sermons, 1543, Henry's last few years to 1547, the reign of King Edward VI, his coronation, the Catechism of 1548, Book of Common Prayer, 1549, Stephen Gardner in the Tower, Death of a Protestant King, 1553, Lady Jane Grey, 1553, the reign of Mary, visit from the Bishop of Winchester, 1555, Degradation and Death, March 1556, Epilogue, Postscript, Cranmer Sermon, Notes by Chapter, Author's Notes, Selected Bibliography. Make our beginning here with the reign of Henry VIII. The the summons of 1532. Thomas Cranmer, King Henry VIII's ambassador to the Holy Roman Emperor, was working at an ornate desk in his study in Mantua, northern Italy. Through his first floor window, he could see trees in a quiet piazza, the leaves turning an autumnal gold. A cheerful wood fire burnt in the grate, taking the chill off a November afternoon. Cranmer was soberly dressed as befitted an ambassador who wished to emphasize that he was a member of the clergy, if only an archdeacon. He had had a determined face, a man who could argue directly with you. His frame was wiry as befitted a strong horse rider. He was in his early 40s. Cranmer was reading a parchment, then referring to an open Bible and another book, and writing comments onto the parchment. He used two quill pens and two inkwells, one red, one black. Spare, sharpened, quick pe quill pens lay next to his inkwells. As ambassador, Cranmer's principal task was to persuade the emperor to support King Henry's request to Pope Clement VII for an annulment of his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. The Holy Roman Emperor was the most powerful man in Europe. His title dated back to the Emperor Charlemagne, who had been crowned in Rome on Rome Christmas Day in 800. The present Emperor, Charles V, ruled over much of Europe the recent Spanish conquests in America meant that the sun never set on his empire. We'll pick that up again as we turn to Professor uh, shift on my glasses here, turn some lights on. And cataract surgery and uh, on the left eye a few days ago. And here we pick up with Professor Edgecombe Hughes on the theology of the English reformers, talking about worship, preaching. We are exhorted also to learn the lesson, not only from the Israelites, but from Christ himself, who drove out with a scourge the profaners of God's temple because they had turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves, that the place of public prayer is to be used and treated with reverence. That will always be an Anglican feature or goal. To neglect to come to God's house or, non, or on coming to behave irreverently in church is to invite the displeasure of God upon ourselves the same displeasure as was forcibly shown by Christ against those who profaned 
the sacred precepts in his day. If we dread the punishment of Almighty God, then proceeds the homily, let us amend our negligence and contempt in coming to the house of the Lord. This, our irreverent behavior in the house of the Lord, and resorting thither diligently together, let us there with reverent hearing of the Lord's holy word, calling on the Lord's holy name. This is Thomas Cranmer in the Book of Homilies, giving thanks unto the Lord for all his manifold and inestimable benefits daily and hourly bestowed upon us, celebrating also reverently the Lord's holy sacraments, serve the Lord in his holy house, as become servants of the Lord in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And then we shall be assured after his this life to rest in his holy will and to dwell in his tabernacle, there to praise and magnify his holy name in the assembly of the saints, in his holy house, his eternal kingdom, which he has purchased for us by his death and shedding of his precious blood, the Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Book of Homilies, page 17, giving Cranmer's view of the dignity, reverence of holy worship. How, how necessary and needful to reiterate these things in our time, carrying on. The worship of Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer, and Judge was for the Reformers not merely an indescribable privilege, but a most solemn responsibility. They approached God with love and joy indeed, but with awe as well, for they were ever conscious of his infinite majesty and holiness. To come before God without seriousness was great wickedness. This seriousness is impressively shown in three longer exhortations of the communion service. This sacrament, which being the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, is to be received in remembrance of his meritorious cross and passion, where alone we obtain, that's the important word for Cranmer, where alone we obtain remission of our sins and are made partakers of the kingdom of heaven, is so divine and comfortable a thing to them who receive it worthily and so dangerous to them who will pres presume to take it unworthily that those proposing to partake of it are urged to search and examine their own consciences that they come holy and clean to such a heavenly feast in this marriage garment required by God and Holy Scripture and be received as worthy partakers of that holy table. That is so refreshing to read Cranmer's view. We turn to, now to Margot Johnson, Thomas Cranmer. She's got an article here on music and English liturgy. There's a great Anglican cathedral tradition which delightfully has been preserved few comments here on this. And the Lutherans have a great tradition too, and the Scottish with psalm singing. I wish we would return to singing psalms. The Te Deum, that's in the prayer book, whose form suggests it was originally intended to be sung by a choir. It's a fourth century hymn. Uh, Te Deum Laudamus, the Latin means we praise God which in the Roman breviary was entitled Psalm Te Deum, was used in the Latin Mass on special occasions, but set to elaborate mu elaborate music, it could form a separate service. Before the Reformation, new feasts introduced into the monastic churches were each accompanied by special antiphons and fresh music. 
musical standards wrote, and we might add Cranmer didn't say a whole lot about music other than he wanted one note for one syllable so it could be understood as against poly polyphony. Musical standards rose and polyphonic music developed both in popularity and complexity as the services themselves became more elaborate. Unfortunately, however, the sense of the words are, were sacrificed frequently to satisfy musical considerations and much was omitted. The preface to the 1549 English prayer book refers to this practice and to the daily psalms of which a few were said or sung and the rest utterly omitted. Erasmus wrote with feeling on the dominance of musical considerations to the neglect of essential elements in worship. The creed was shortened, the Lord's Prayer inaudible, the singing of the prosa too long, words were compressed and omitted to favor the music, and especially when fabudons were sung, they produced a tremendous tonal clamor so that not a single word was understood. Continental changes began in the 1520s with Lutheran vernacular services, and there were papal attempts to revise and shorten the Latin rites. The Roman breviary or abridgment of the daily offices drawn up originally under Pope Hildebrand, Gregory the Seventh, 1073 to 1086, was reformed and revised in 1516. And in 1541, the Salisbury breviary was issued and further reformed. That's at the end, that's in, towards the end of Henry's reign. Cranmer's in office, and the musicians are bringing some reform. Similar attempt by Ferdinand Quinones, the Spanish cardinal, to introduce a further compression and revision of the Roman breviary in 1535. And again, revised the following year, were so well received that it was reprinted six times between 1535 and 1536. We'll bring that to a close as we take up later continental reforms with Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and then the Englishman. We turn to Prof. McCulloch on Cranmer and the matrimonial games of Henry. Are we on uh, Anne of Cleves? I think so. No, Catherine Howard. Oh boy, here we go. The links. In a very tricky situation, Cranmer got support from a surprising direction. Catherine Howard herself. According to Wakefield, um, she conveyed the reassuring message to the Archbishop that you should not care for your businesses, for you should be in better case than ever you were. The reason for this favor was the opposition, which we've already noted, expressed by Cranmer to Cromwell's Anne of Cleves marriage project, or Cromwell, I should say. Cromwell wanted a connection with the German Schmalkaldic League, and Anne of Cleves was a, a bridge to that end. Cranmer didn't think so. He thought Henry needed an English girl who could speak English, and Anne of Cleves did not. This background helps explain why the Archbishop was so ready to cooperate with the King's move from number four, that was Catherine Howard, I think it was, to number five. One wonders why Lord Herbert of Cherbury never found a place in the life of Henry VIII for these interesting depositions, which now only survive in his secretary's research notes. It is likely that he felt they did not reflect well on Cranmer 
particularly in view of the Archbishop's later role as the agent for Catherine's destruction. Earlier, Herbert, that he was a writer on Cranmer, and his researcher had just had been just embarrassed by some of the Archbishop's actions at Dunstable in the Aragon proceedings. And, well, he should have been embarrassed because Cranmer was really it stained his reputation. Indeed, Cranmer's connivance at Henry's marital adventures reached its most dismal depth in the summer of 1540, with only partial consideration that the rest of the authorities in the English and church and parliament were equally implicated. There was a larger picture going on. By fall of 1540, Cromwell's head has rolled. The first sign of the annulment plan came quickly, quietly, and obliquely on 2 July 1540, when a bill reducing the scope of marriage impediments by an affinity and pre-contracts were introduced into the Lords, it was committed to bishops Cranmer, Tunstall, Gardner, and Heath, quite a mix there, to examine, in fact, this is the first recorded mention of a committee procedure in the House of Lords. The bill was clearly intended to help with the affinity problem raised by Gwent in his indiscretion, and among other provisions it declared that the relationship between first cousins did not constitute a divine prohibition of affinity. As an incidental result, it had disastrous effects on the income from fees in Cranmer's faculty office. Thereafter, the office had few, fewer marital obstacles which required the issue of dispensations. On 5 July, the government went public in Parliament with what everyone knew. The following day, a royal commission was issued for trying the annulment case of the clergy in England. In other words, the assembly, which others would have been, which in other days would have been Cromwell's vice gerential synod of both provinces, now with the vice gerent legally, although not actually dead, Cranmer presided over the proceedings while Gardner also played a prominent part in the forwarding of that procedure. It's a page for, I got a picture of a page from the instrument of the clergy annulling the marriage of Anne of Cleves and Henry VIII with Thomas Cranmer's signature at the bottom, dated Westminster, 9 July, 1539. And when does Cromwell lose his head? July 10? Note Cranmer's signature heading the, the bishops, accompanied by the signature of Archbishop Lee. We'll pick up that matrimonial story. Now for Arthur Innes. And we pick up here the affairs that were going on in the continent. And the backdrop to Cranmer. Education was a primary object, not a few of the reformers, with not with a, with many of the reformers of all schools. With none was it carried to such a pitch as with the Jesuits. They established colleges everywhere. They trained their pupils' brains up to the highest capacity. They instilled absolute discipline and a machine was thereby constructed which answered to the will of the engineer with an unparalleled perfection, education, strong discipline. The devotion of the members of the organization of the Jesuits was unfailing, but the system carried with it as of its essence without which it could not exist one quality fatal from an ethical point of view 
It killed the individual sense of personal moral responsibility when it converted him into an exquisitely finished cog in a consummately constructed machine. The moral, the moral law was absorbed in obedience. The Jesuit school sent forth many heroes and many martyrs, but wherever their influence obtained, it inevitably and deliberately strangled freedom of conscience. There's a saying for of the Jesuits, Sacrificio di intellecta pro papa, sat even the sacrifice of the intellect for the Pope. It was in the second year after the vow at Montmartre that the new portent appeared in a theological firmament when Calvin published his Institutes. In a way of coincidences and contrasts, it's a curious note that Loyola, who was first to exercise a supreme influence on the Roman Catholic world, was born in the birth year of Henry VIII, while Calvin, who was to exercise in his term a supreme influence on the Protestant world, was born in the year of his accession to the throne, 1509. Calvin becomes quite influential, extremely influential in Elizabethan England. We turn now to Leslie Williams, a wonderful handbook, clearly written, it's written by an English professor, The Emblem of Faith Untouched. Chapter 11, Danger. We've got a collect here. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities, stretch forth thy right hand to help and defend us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're back in the year 1540, we were just talking about in McCulloch was a dangerous year for Archbishop Cranmer and those with Protestant leanings pressing forward with the momentum gained from the six articles of 1539, which was a co six articles, but it was also a co code for a return to Romanism without the Pope. Oh, Cranmer's under the gun. The Henrician Catholics conspired to demolish their enemies, including Bishop Steve Gardner as one of those. Frightened once again by the growing friendship between Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the French King, Henry decided to adopt Cromwell's plan to marry Anne of Cleves. German delegates from Cleves and Saxony came to Windsor. Cranmer helped to hammer out a marriage treaty. Cromwell had fought long and hard for this alliance, and Henry was swayed by a picture of how pretty she was, and then faulted the artists for exaggerating. Swayed by Cromwell's praise of Anne's beauty, and aided by a flattering portrait by Holbein, an uncertain Henry, caved in. After the six articles of 1539 that Germans had given up on, on Henry, despairing that he was but a political opportunist, utterly unprincipled in religion, they said. However, after the marriage had been negotiated, hopes rose again amongst the continental reformers. Some Germans thought Henry might even repeal the six articles after he married Anne of Cleves. Anne arrived from the continent at Dover in Kent on December 27, 1539. In the wind and sleep, Cranmer, three bishops, and a few neighboring gentlemen and Cranmer's servants received her as a welcoming committee three miles outside Canterbury. Cranmer rode with her to meet the king 
at a spectacular reception back in London at Greenwich. Henry took one look at Anne and realized that Holbein misrepresented her features. Disgusted with her looks, he immediately called forth doubts about the legality of the marriage. Reaching for any excuse, he claimed that the pre-contract of Francis of Lorraine prevented her, prevented him from marrying her. Sullen, Henry called his bride-to-be the Flanders mare or the Flanders horse and asked Cromwell if he really had to go through with the marriage. Henry postponed the marriage for two days and ordered Cranmer and others to hash out the legalities which, with the envoys of Cleves in 1540 will be a catastrophic year. We turn now to Thomas Cranmer, Paul Ayers's edition, an article by Eamon Duffy talking about Cranmer and the popular religion. In, in that highly compressed picture of the liturgical year in a Suffolk village, it's evident that the processions were an important piece of liturgical variety on several levels. The carrying of the Blessed Sacrament, banners and images, ringing of handbells, and though it is not mentioned, the sprinkling of holy water, which was An invariable feature of these processions were designated to exercise people, church, village, and fields, and to banish the devil. The processions are also the instrument and expression of a sense of community. Consider the four yeomen who carried the canopy. How were they chosen? The dominant feature of the professions was parish solidarity. The more prosperous inhabitants provided food and drink for the parish, and charity was dispensed to the poor. A century later, the Anglican priest George Herbert summed up the multi-layered character of the Rogation Tide procession as they survived in Protestant England. There were, he wrote, contained four manifest advantages. First, a blessing of God for the fruits of the field. Secondly, justice in the preservation of bounds. Thirdly, charity in loving, walking, and neighborly accompanying one another with reconciling differences at that time, if there were any. Fourthly, mercy in relieving the poor. What, it, what was true of 17th century Rogation Tide observances was abundantly more so in the late medieval church, and even the weekly parish procession was understood as a ritual focus of charity in the fullest sense of the word. When Cranmer's predecessor, Archbishop Warham, carried out his diocesan visitation in 1511, the villagers of Tenderden complained of evil-disposed persons who banded together in the churchyard during the divine service and symbolized their alienation from their orthodox neighbors by sitting still in the church before the procession time. But it should be noted that the procession function as a creator and focus of neighborly charity could only artificially be divorced from its character as an exorcism. One of the principal activities of demons in the late medieval thought was stirrers of strife, just as they had also stirred up the elements to produce storms and lightning. Thus, an immediate and de direct effect of the banishing of the devil from the parish was the creation of harmony and of divine life and charity. He's talking about popular devotion in Cranmer's time. 
turn to our last volume here by Jasper Ridley on Thomas Cranmer, one of the best uh, biographies on Cranmer. Cranmer was equally firm in Scory's case. Forget what the context here. 1539 articles or the crisis year of 1543. Cranmer's in hot water by then. The conservative prebendaries at Canterbury complained that Cranmer did not take any proceedings against Scory and Lancelot Ridley, two prebendaries at Christ Church in Canterbury. They were the, the, the reformers. But it was not heretical for Scory and Lancelot Ridley to preach that church services should be in English instead of Latin. Well, it was certainly unwise, but we don't think that's quite right, Jasper. While the more serious charges against Scory accused him of expressing matters himself on baptism, which he would never have advocated even under Edward VI. As soon as Cranmer was informed that Scory had criticized the real presence, he lost no time in arresting him. Cranmer was a a Romanist on um, bone munchy cruncher views at this point. Though Scory was later released in the absence of any proof of his offense. The conservative canons and clergy and historians three centuries later were ready to believe any rumor against Cranmer on quite, quite insufficient evidence. Willoughby, who was a royal chaplain and leading organizer of the plot against Cranmer, stated that Cranmer had on one occasion delivered a lecture, booted and spurred, in which he said that the sacrament of the altar was only a similitude. We can be certain that Cranmer had said no such thing, but Willoughby had heard this story from someone. He could no longer remember from whom while they were gossiping at table. Canon Gardner, relative of Bishop Steve Gardner, Canon Gardner of Canterbury, said that Cranmer had told his Chancellor Barber in the privacy of his room at Canterbury that he would defend the doctrines of Scory and Lancelot Ridley had preached on the subject of baptism an original sin before any impartial judgment, that if they wished to find an impartial judge, it would be necessary to fetch one from Germany. Cranmer might have said this in 1538, but not 1541. And Cardner, Canon Gardner had only heard the story third hand. Car Canon Gardner also informed Bishop Gardner that at least once a month, Cranmer received letters from Germany and wrote letters in reply, which passed through the hands of a man at Fleur de Lis Inn at Canterbury. And the prebendary was convinced that another man who visited Canterbury was a spy from Germany. The rumors floated and did not spare Cranmer's family. His brother Edmund, the Archdeacon of Canterbury, was accused of improperly removing lights and breaking images. And Shether wrote to Bishop Gardner that Cranmer's sister, the mother of Nevinson's wife, had two husbands living as it is of many thought. As usual, none of these rumor mongers suggested that Cranmer was married. Uh, and he was. But throughout these years, Margaret was almost certainly in Germany after the 1539 articles, which may explain the monthly letters which were brought to the Fleur de Linz in. We'll pick this up about more on the storm of 1543 that only Henry. Henry's intervention saved Cranmer from destruction. Let's bring this 
session to an end. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and always will be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed and good to see some friends here.